boa tarde a todos. É prazer de novo estar aqui com vocês nesse nosso encontro semanal. É, gostaria de, antes de começar o nosso seminário, é, lembrá-los de, por favor, subscrever o canal, deixar o seu like, que tudo isso nos ajuda a subsistir aqui no YouTube. Tá? Hoje a gente vai ter o prazer de ter um convidado muito especial, diretamente de Berkeley, da Universidade de Berkeley, na Califórnia. E é, eu espero que vocês aproveitem, vai, a gente vai ter um tema novo na nossa disciplina. E eu vou passar imediatamente para o professor Krieger, coordenador do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Biologia Molecular e professor do nosso Departamento de Biologia Celular, para apresentar o nosso convidado, Dr. Karen. Krieger. Hello. Ok, I'll share my screen again and jump right into it. Krieger, o seu microfone está desligado. Ok, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so just a minute, just to Krieger make the introduction, okay? So, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Karen, that currently works at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineer at the University of California, Berkeley. So, Dr. Ray does research in microbiology, biogeochemistry, and using metagenomic tools as a means to understand several metabolic processes in microbial communi communities. Dr. Karen has more than 17 high-impact publications on the field of microbial ecology. Uh, we overlap a little bit at uh, Jill Benfield Lab at the Department of Earth and Planetary Science at UC Berkeley when I was a visiting professor. And today is my pleasure then to introduce uh, Dr. Ray, Karen, and he'll talk about uh, his work, the latest work on bacteria interactions as the basis of performance crashes in NMOX bioreactor. So we, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Ray. So we are you. all yours. Okay, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to give that talk. And it's a pleasure to see you again and talk a little bit about my work. So I'll jump right in. Uh, today, I will uh, talk about uh, bacterial interactions at the basis of performance crashes in an Atomox bioreactor. Uh, this is a reactor that has been built and run in uh, Lisa Alvarez Cohen lab at the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. So starting with the nitrogen cycle, uh, it's composed of both aerobic reaction, the oxidation of ammonia all the way to nitrate, and also anaerobic reactions, which are mainly the reduction of nitrate to atmospheric nitrogen or back to ammonia. And the Anamox uh, process, where you can see in pink here, is anaerobic and is uniquely because it can oxidize ammonia while reducing nitrate. Um, the bacteria itself is also quite unique. So bacteria that are capable of Anamox were first discovered in a wastewater treatment plant in the mid-90s in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, all Anamox bacteria so far have been only discovered in the phylum uh, Plantomyces. And these bacteria you can see here in a TM image have a unique, very large organelle-like structure called the Anamoxosome. And that's where the actual uh, uh, reactions uh, take place. And Anamox bacteria can contribute as much as a third of nitrogen gas formation, both in marine and terrestrial environments alike. As I said, it was uh, this first discovered in wastewater treatment plants, and it's also commercially used uh, to treat a municipal wastewater. Uh, in the United States alone, there are over 100 operating Anamox reactors in wastewater treatment facilities. And basically, uh, it's a downstream step. So first, the first steps are removing uh, solids. And once the solids are removed, uh, the main contaminant that is left is ammonium. And there are two main ways that are used in industry to remove ammonium. Um, the first one is the most common process, which is nitrification followed by denitrification. This is done uh, both for mainstream municipal waste 
and sites and, and municipal waste. Um, the first process, the first stage here requires a lot of mixing and aeration. So it's an, it's an aerobic step. So oxidizing ammonia to nitrate. And bacteria that do that need air, they need carbon. So there's a lot of input that goes on into the system. And also uh, during the denitrification part, one of the issues is that there are greenhouse gases that are emitted mostly nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. Now, the Anamox process, or more correctly, partial nitration uh, Anamox, is only used for uh, ammonia-rich or nitrogen-rich side stream treatment. Uh, the cons of using an Anamox uh, treatment is that it requires up to 60% less energy, and it reduces the biomass weight by up to 90%. And there's also um, almost no gas uh, greenhouse emission because the Anamox both fixes CO2 and it creates a nitrate, nitrogen gas and does not go through all of the um, intermediates that happens in denitrification. Uh, sorry, move back. Now, one issue with Anamox is that it's not very stable. Uh, sorry, I just want to make sure that it doesn't move again. Yes, so the Anamox process is not stable. These bacteria are slow growing and they can be inhibited by a high nitrite, for instance. And once a reactor uh, crashes, it may take up to six months to restart it. So there's a lot of problems here. So it, it's not yet a robust enough to, um, industry to treat all of the, the wastewater. Uh, but there is a lot of progress. Uh, one of the largest developments is the advancements in sequencing and bioinformatics, which I work with. And that enables us to study um, the Anamox bacterium within its community. Another thing that, uh, another issue for industry is that there is no Anamox isolate. So all of these bacteria live with a community, so it makes a research and development much harder. So you cannot optimize a strain if you cannot grow uh, the bacteria uh, in, in pure culture. So here comes, uh, basically bioinformatics to give us an opportunity to still uh, study this uh, bacteria. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, our lab-based reactor. Here you can see on the top left, this is our reactor. These are actually three reactors that we have running. On the top right, you can see a schematic uh, of how it was uh, constructed. There's media inflow, that's the reactor with the Anamox, and gas inflow, and so forth. And here on the bottom left, I'm um, sorry that it keeps moving in all sorts of weird directions. On the bottom left, you can see how the community looks like. So it's red and granular. Um, I'm not going to go a lot into all the technical specification, but basically it's a one liter reactor. It has a 0.4 membrane filter and it was enriched with uh, anaerobic digester solids. And moving on to the Atomox performance. Uh, here you can see in the graph, uh, the X axis are days of running the reactor. The left y-axis shows you nitrogen concentration. We measured influent ammonia, effluent ammonia, influent nitrite, and effluent nitrite, and also nitrate uh, in the effluent. And on the right uh, y-axis or in black line is the calculated nitrogen removal rate. Um, 
overall, you can see that, uh, again, you see here that there was a long, a pretty long startup phase. And you, if you can watch, there were several areas where we had crashes uh, in performance and issues. Um, let's move on. So the, I'm going to focus on two of these performance crashes. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, the first uh, performance crash was unexpected. So the reactor was working stably for around 75 days. We did not see any issues. And then very quickly, we saw spikes in nitrite and then the Animox reactor completely crashed, so the performance stopped, uh, and it took a very long time until it started recovering. There was no technical issue, so, I mean, you have this area here before that, where we had a few technical issues, so the rotor stopped working, the, the heater was not working or working too much, so you get these little uh, problems, but here everything was working fine. So. Our only conclusion was that uh, this was uh, biologically driven. And moving on uh, to the next um, part. Uh, so this uh, crash was actually experimentally uh, driven. So uh, a grad student in our lab, Ned, wanted to try and replicate the performance crash. And he, I will get uh, into it, but basically he declined the sludge retention time, which means that he removed the sludge, he removed biomass at higher rates, which uh, means that bacteria that grow faster will become more dominant, and the Animox bacterium is a slow-growing bacteria. So the, uh, removing or having lower sludge retention time means that we have less Animox, and Animox is working harder. And moving on to the methods, how I did my work. Um, this is a bit of a complicated and long slide, and I'll try to go through it as um, clearly as I can. So we had community sequencing from uh, 14 time points throughout the reactor history. What we did from each uh, time point, we sampled uh, the community DNA, um, we did uh, assembly, uh, we binned genomes, so we picked up the DNA that belongs to each genome using methods um, that some of you uh, may have heard from uh, Professor uh, Kruger. Uh, he did that work with, uh, in Jill's lab. And after we had the genomes from each time point, uh, we did something that is called dereplication. Basically, we took all of the genomes and we compared their average nucleotide identity. That's the most robust way to figure out if two genomes belong to the same bacterial species. And once we did that, we clustered uh, the different species and we can say, out of this cluster, we have, for instance, five genomes in that cluster. This is the best representative genome with the highest quality, and we're using that to represent that species in the, react in the reactor history. And that's how we, that's, that was the start of the work. So basically setting up what's the community and what are the representative, <coughs> sorry, species within the community. And from there, we could move on and for binning, uh, we did both manual binning, we did some automated binning, so using some, some programs that uh, tell you how the DNA splits up. <clears throat> and from everything together, we chose the best uh, genome possible. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, one second. So now we had, <clears throat> around 130 representative genomes. Each one of them represents a bacterial species. 
Um, we wanted to look at several um, things. So first of all, using ribosomal proteins, uh, 15 ribosomal proteins that appear once in each genome. We build a phylogenetic tree to assess uh, the core community of the Anamox reactor. We used uh, coverage data. So when you have a genome from the DNA, you can map the the sequence reads back to it and calculate coverage. So how many times uh, a genome was basically sequenced, let's say, and this gives you some relative abundance like uh, value. And with that, we could look at community dynamics. So I've already shown you the uh, reactor history. Things change throughout uh, reactor history and we thought the bacteria community could have also changed. And lastly, uh, we annotated the genes uh, in those genomes, and we could look at metabolic profiles for each of the genomes. And the nice thing about working with a genome-centric approach, so we're looking at genomes in a community, is that we could not only say this community can reduce nitrate, we can say, this specific bacterium in the community can reduce nitrate, while another one can reduce nitrite. So it has more meaning for the interactions between community members. Okay, let's begin with the first crash. Um, the results I'm presenting here were published uh, in the journal uh, Microbiome at the beginning of the year. You can see this, uh, the title here. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, we had uh, for the paper we had three aims. Uh, we wanted to look at the microbial community because most studies up to that date mostly focused only on the Anamox bacterium and did not look at the entire community. Um, most work has been done on stable Anamox reactor, and we had the startup phase, so we also focused on that. And we had the unexplained uh, performance crash, and we explored uh, that. Uh, in my talk, I'm mostly going to talk about uh, the uh, performance crash, but I do want to uh, have a quick look at the Anamox core community. Um, here you can see a phylogenetic tree that I built with the ribosomal proteins. Uh, I also used um, 3,500 uh, reference genomes from diverse environments um, that uh, the Banfield Lab has. And the dashed red lines show you where bacteria from our reactor uh, were found. There are, I also uh, plotted uh, two other uh, samples. Let's jump in, sorry. Ah, come on. So we had uh, two other papers that came out in 2016, uh, Spef et al. and Lawson et al. They also had really good work and had genomes, so we also plotted them. So Spef is in green and Lawson uh, genomes are in blue. Here is the uh, planktomyces, the animal bacterium. And there are two main points that I wanna say here. The, the animal community on one hand, is very diverse. You can see that there are, oh, come on, um, red dashes all over uh, the tree in multiple phyla. So each color here represents a different phyla. You can see the name. Uh, okay. I have to keep my mouse in one position, otherwise it keeps moving it. But the Aramox community is also very unique. So if you look at the species level, most of the species in the community are relative to other species in the community or from the other two uh, Anamox reactors. So that's the core Anamox community. And moving on to the unexpected crush, as I said, 75 days, reactor was working perfectly. And then uh, suddenly it stopped working. We had no idea why. So we decided to investigate uh, how a bacteria can drive the Anamox performance crash. Now, 
we wanted to figure out a set of basically rule of thumbs, as you say, to detect if a bacterium can actually be a causative agent in the performance crash and not just respond to it. A, a lot of work just looks at, oh, this, something happened and these bacteria are now more abundant, but that is correlation. That's not causation. That doesn't mean that they caused anything to happen. It just means that they reacted, reacted positively to something that happened in the past. But it is important to see that bacteria, that some of the bacteria that were um, driving the performance crash didn't, did enjoy the results. So we did want to see that bacteria uh, that show abundance, uh, show increasing abundance during the performance crash. But we also want to, to see that these bacteria also show an increase in the replication rate before the crash. I would go into uh, a bit of an in-depth explanation of, about that. And lastly, uh, we wanted to see that the bacteria that we suspect caused the crash had some uh, metabolic context. So we could give some plausible explanation of what interaction could have caused uh, the performance to, to decline. Okay, so looking at the first two rules of thumb here, it's a bit of a messy uh, table, I know, but you can see here we have the main or the most dominant bacteria in the reactor during the crash. The first one, Brocade, is the Anamox bacterium. Second column here is the relative abundance. Uh, third column would show you if there basically if their abundance increased or decreased uh, during the crash. And the third one shows you if the replication increased or decreased before the crash. So um, obviously uh, yellow thumbs up means significant increase, red thumbs down means significant decrease, or otherwise it was inconclusive, which means uh, there was no statistical strength to say uh, that something changed one way or the other. So um, how we checked the increase in abundance was using a log ratio. Uh, we did log just to center values around zero, but the idea is to look at the ratio of the coverage after the crash or during the crash versus before the crash. And we wanted to see that it was uh, significant. So it was outside of the confidence interval measured for all possible changes in, in abundance. And now I will explain a little bit about replication. So um, we do the replication calculation based on um, an interesting phenomenon. So when a bacteria starts replicating, it starts from the origin of replication and it starts a fork. So it starts replicating and it goes in both sides towards the terminus of replication, which means that during the middle of replication, for instance, uh, the areas that are closer to the origin of replication would have more DNA in them. And in bioinformatics and metagenome studies, that means that the, the coverage near the origin of replication would be higher than the coverage near the terminus of replication. And by calculating the difference between coverage at the origin of replication and at the terminus of replication, we can see basically how much replication is occurring. Uh, we have um, a program that was developed in, in the Banfield lab that does that for uh, metagenomic sequencing. Uh, it's a bit more trickier, but the bottom line is if you have a value of one, because it's a relative, it's a, again, it's a ratio value. If you have a value of one, you have basically zero replication in the community. And if you have a value of two, you have on average, the entire population of the bacteria or the bacterium species is replicating. 
Uh, what we found for uh, very interesting for Brocadia, for the animals bacterium, that just prior to the crash, we were very lucky that to have a sampling point that was seven days before the uh, performance crash occurred. It had a replication value almost at one, which means that a week before we can see uh, something happening in the performance of the reactor, we could also, we could already see metagenomically that something has happened. The bacteria stopped replicating. It's not growing anymore. And another thing that we can see here, so there are several bacteria, Ignavi bacteria and Chloriflexi, that show both an increase in, uh, in abundance during the crash and the replication increased before the crash, which means that they started, what happened to them, their dynamics started before we can see something happening, which to us means that they passed both rules of thumb and they are suspected as destabilizing the community. Now, the final question we have is, can we find some metabolic interaction um, that, to explain it? Uh, the first thing we looked at was <clears throat> the nitrogen cycle. So here I'm showing you the relevant parts of the nitrogen cycle. So we have the Brocadia, the Anamox bacterium performing Anamox. And what we found was that the bacteria that we saw that were potential destabilizer were bacteria that uh, <clears throat> were capable of dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonia or DNRA. This means that these bacteria that were growing faster and faster and becoming more and more abundant we're competing with the Animox bacterium for uh, its electron source. So they were competing, both of them are using nitrite. So we have this group of bacteria that are competing with the Animox for its electron uh, donor. Donor, yeah. Um, next, we also wanted to look at uh, carbon metabolism. Always very important. Uh, to look at carbon metabolism. I did not mention it before, but uh, in our reactor, uh, Anamox bacterium was the only bacterium that is capable of uh, fixing uh, carbon. And since the input into the reactor does not include any organic carbon, basically we have Anamox as the primary producer. It fixes uh, CO2 and excretes um, carbon into the media and all of the other heterotrophic bacteria basically feed off the animal bacteria. Here you can see a schematic of um, some aspects of the chloroflexi metabolism that were um, enriched in those bacteria. Uh, here on the surface you can see that chloroflexi bacteria had a lot of transporters. They could take up proteins, they could take up amino acids, they could take up sugars. And also uh, above it, they also excreted a lot of uh, proteases, amino uh, peptidases, and all sorts of things. So they excreted enzymes that broke up the organic matrix and took up organic carbon and ate it. So that gives us the context. So we had the chloroflexi bacteria and to a lesser extent, uh, uh, Ignavi bacterium that both uh, ate a lot of carbon. So they were growing fast and they were eating more and more carbon. So they were creating more and more stress on the Animox bacterium that produces this carbon, this organic carbon while at the same time they were competing with the Animox bacterium for its electron donor, is donor, which means that it could produce less energy. And this, we decided, was what causes the, uh, the performance crash. So we have been able to detect bacteria that uh, show all three rules of thumb. And moving on to the control performance crush. So now we know that we have heterotrophic DNA bacteria that can grow fast and, and 
they can compete with the Anamox and destabilize the Anamox performance. And as I said before, SRT, sludge retention times, uh, is a mean of selecting bacteria, sorry, uh, that grow faster. And we wanted to see if we could induce a similar performance crash as we saw unexpectedly. And going back to the um, performance crash, <clears throat> again, but the Anamox was working, like the performance was working, looking fine, even though the SRT was being reduced during that time until it hit some point where performance went down very, very fast. And we knew what to do, and we were able to also create a fast recovery which I'm not going to go into. Um, already, uh, you can see here, these are uh, images of the reactor. So this, this is what the reactor looked at, at at the beginning of the experiment, midway when we reduced the SRT, and while it, the performance was crashed. And you can see that the granular material the red granular material, which is the Anamox bacterium, basically loses color, loses its stability, it breaks up until you have this gray flocular material of just free uh, floating bacteria. Now again, we wanted to see um, the free rules of thumb. Again, the most, the top most uh, dominant bacteria, the relative abundance, which bacteria uh, showed an increase in, uh, in, grow, in, in abundance and which bacteria showed an increase in replication before. Again, we can see we have an Ignavi bacteria here that has both an increase in uh, abundance and replication. Here we have uh, another chloroflexi and we also had an alpha protobacteria, but I can already tell you that this bacterium is just a hanger on. It, it was always abundant and it, it couldn't have done anything to, to cause the crash. <clears throat> Another nice thing that we had uh, during the experiment is that we had a metatranscriptomic sequencing, which means that we could look at uh, gene expression and not just the genes themselves. And here, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, we, you can see a graph of nitrate reductase, reductase uh, expression levels uh, during the crash. So this is the beginning of the experiment. This area is the middle of the crash. And you can see how uh, nitrate reductase uh, expression for the Anamox bacteria, the DNRA bacteria, and bacteria capable of denitrification, how much they express. And again, similar uh, to the first uh, performance crash, DNRA bacteria became very dominant. And the, the metabolism was very dominant during the crash. And the Anamox uh, declined during the crash. And here you can see that it was already recovering towards the end. Uh, Uh, this is a very, I mean, it's a bit hard to see, but this is a heat map of extracellular enzymes. And on the top, you have bacteria that are DNA bacteria, and the green rows are the Anamox bacteria. And again, similarly to its also expression levels. <clears throat> and again, you can see in a similar manner to the first crash, these DNA bacteria increase the expression of these extracellular enzymes that basically break up the outside carbon and Anamox bacteria has a decrease in its overall uh, production and overall uh, metabolism. So <clears throat> once again, um, we could find several bacteria that uh, we could say uh, were detrimental to the Anamox reactor and destabilized the Anamox reactor and caused the crash. The, the increase in uh, their abundance and replication, we could 
again show that DNA is the dominant pathway, and they're also basically using up more of the extracellular carbon. Um, up until now, uh, I've shown you the data uh, separated. So I looked at each crash separately. And the next thing we wanted to see is how much the uh, overall community um, was similar or different between them. So did we, were we actually able to replicate the community from the first crash? Or was it something that was just random and completely different? So again, showing you the performance history, the first performance crash and the second performance crash. So uh, to compare the communities, what we did was uh, we did a pairwise uh, person correlation of the abundance of each bacteria at each time point and to see how they change overall. And on that data, we applied hierarchical clustering. Um, and this is shown here in the dendrogram. And the first thing that uh, I'll show you, so we have here, these two branches are uh, time points related to the first um, performance crash. And these two time points uh, are related to the second performance crash. So, you can see that they're not clustered together. So the community was different. But what is interesting is that if we look at the overall uh, structure of the community over time, we can say that everything that happened after the first uh, performance crash is different. So the, f the, the thing that defines the community most throughout the perf our reactor history is the first crash. It completely changed the community composition or the community dynamics and relation. And after that time point, what separates the community the most is nitrogen loading. So these time points, um, the um, reactor was fed less nitrogen than these time points. So this is the second thing that differentiates the community. On the left main branch, these two time points are, uh, this is sludge basically, and on, on day 166, we added more sludge to, uh, to the reactor when there was some technical issue. So these two time points look similar together. So overall, the we have something that we thought was similar, but then again, the community does not look similar. But what if we look at the most dominant bacteria? So here you can see that we have uh, the most dominant bacteria during the first crush and during the second crush. And there are some bacteria that are shared. So Brocadia was obviously shared between all time points. But we also see this Ignavi bacterium and this Chloriflexi that were, two of them were very important destabilizers during the first crash, and they were also quite abundant during the second crash. These two bacteria in purple were abundant at all time points, and they were also abundant during the second crash. So there are some similarities. So these two performance crashes share some dominant bacteria, but not all dominant bacteria. Another interesting point that I want to uh, point out that while it looks like th that during the first crash, Brocadia was much more uh, dominant than the second one, what we saw that uh, it actually had a very, very similar effect. So the abundance of uh, the Anamox bacterium decreased by about 40% in both cases within the same time frame. So it, it took about 45 days to decrease the um, Anamox uh, abundance by 40% in both time frames. And uh, I'm coming to the conclusions. So the Anamox community, when it's performing 
performing as it is expected to perform is maintaining this equilibrium between Anamox bacterium, which is the main producer, uh, primary producer, and the rest of its heterotrophic community. Now, when we have problems, uh, that means that this equilibrium is challenged. So, but uh, other community members can compete with Anamox for nitrogen source, and at the same time, they consume more and more carbon, which is produced by the Anamox bacterium. So we have this dual perturbation. We have competition of sources and depletion of organic carbon, and this is found at the basis of both uh, performance crashes. And what I think is very important is that even though the communities are not the same, we see the same process. And that is a stronger point to make. So it doesn't matter what specific community you have in the Anamox reactor. What we expect to see is the same thing uh, when, when we have a performance crash. So that means that the interactions and the functional guilds within, in the community are much more important than the specific identity of the bacterium, although in both cases, we do know that it's the same group. So it's Chloriflexi and Ignavi bacterium that cause these performance crashes, but it can be slightly different uh, species of them. Um, another point that is very important that um, our lab, in our lab reactor, we did not have any organic uh, carbon input, but in uh, full, uh, full-scale reactors, they, the input is wastewater. And wastewater, although it doesn't have a lot of organic carbon after the initial uh, steps of uh, wastewater treatment, it still has some organic carbon, which means that what we see in our reactor has a dead, basically has a time limit. The heterotrophic bacteria can grow and become dominant, but they don't have more organic carbon. So at some point, they cannot keep growing. In a full-scale reactor, you have always some more input of organic carbon. So that issue, this dominance of heterotrophic bacteria can be prolonged. So looking at this bacterium and monitoring this bacterium and their interaction is very important in full-scale Anamox reactors. And uh, yeah, that's my talk. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of the uh, people that did a lot of hard work on this uh, project, both in the Alvarez Coin Lab and in the Banfield Lab. I would like to thank my advisors, uh, Professor Lisa Alvarez Cohen and Professor Jill Banfield. I want to thank uh, Ned, with the graduate students that did an amazing work on the uh, SRT reduction experiment and did all the transcriptomic analysis and all the rest of the uh, basically collaborators, grad students, postdocs that worked on the project. And thanks to the funding agencies. And thank you for uh, <laughs> to me draw on and on about the Animox, uh, yeah. Uh, we we like to celebrate birthdays for you, <laughs> especially yeah. managers to go through a whole year without uh, any performance questions. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, um, I'll happily answer any questions that somebody has. Thank you so much for the nice talk. It's a uh, very interesting uh, work and very relevant to, to. So we have some questions from the audience, but uh, as always, like we have the microphone, we make ours first. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, and I have some questions because I'm not of the area, of course, you can see immunology guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was wondering if, uh, is it possible we this sample that you make a uh, uh, unit, meu áudio, okay, uh -huh. aqui. É porque eu tô com a, a 
microphone that's not my usual one. Okay. I don't know what is my usual one. <laughs> so um, I, I was wondering if is it possible to see relative abundance among species in the sample you do, like we do in transcriptome, uh, finding some tags for a species. Is, is that what you do? And you count uh, hits? Is that what you do? Is, is the same process? It's a similar process. So we do, we sample all of the DNA of all of the bacteria. And then what we get is very small pieces of DNA, which are around 150 base pairs. And mm -hmm. what we do, what I, when I say mapping, is basically we match this particular piece to mm -hmm. the different bacteria we were able to define. And that's how we get the coverage data, and that's how we know which bacteria is more dominant. It's, it's the same thing for metatranscriptomics. So instead of yes, yes. mapping the DNA, we map the RNA, and we usually only map it to the genes. Because of the, the pathway that you, you are interested on. Yeah, I mean, we can, the, the nice thing is that we, can, we have enough computational power to map all of the RNA to all of the genes and then just subset the ones that we care about. Um, it's also and, better. And, than and you have a statistic around it to, to see how, how relevant it is and if yeah, you have yeah. control, like, uh, like we have, for example, uh, a constitutive gene uh, just to see, you have something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I, I unfortunately don't remember a lot of how this specific program runs, but it's a program in R that basically mm -hmm. was built to uh, look at the expression in RNA. And there are a lot of normalizations that go into it, not only comparing expression rates to other uh, household genes, but we also need to account for possible differences in how, how much we sample. So if, for instance, we got two times more RNA from one sample compared to the other, we have to account for that. It's not that everything would be expressed twice as much. We need to uh -huh. account for that. So there is a lot of normalization that is um, mm -hmm. including in the analysis, yes. OK, thank you. <laughs> can you begin with the? the yes, the... yes. Uh, Ray, you have several questions. I will make uh, a few of those just to, you know, to guide the discussion. And then we'll usually we'll let the students do first. But okay. as Andrea said, you have the microphone, so have the the yield here. So I will make some couple of questions just to guide the uh, the discussion, and then we move on to the students. Okay. So uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah. So I would like you to explain very nicely uh, the process of, of IREP, right? So yeah. if you can you know, elaborate a little bit more and explain to us, uh, especially the normalization, I have some students work about, uh, talking about right now on the internet and asking about the normalization process for the IREP. <laughs> so the only thing that's important uh, is, is that the students understand that you are measuring growth rate if yeah. I involved in our growth curve, right? So you're using DNA sequences, you know, yeah. data, to infer that growth rate. So this is very neat, very interesting for the students to understand what you have been doing and uh, using IREP. Yeah. So you can, you know. I'll, I'll try to explain. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a tricky uh, program. And Chris did a lot of very fancy computer work <laughs> uh -huh. when he wrote it. But... Basically, as I was saying, when we have a single species, when we have an isolate and we sequence the, the entire g genome, we can uh, just say, look, I identified the origin of uh, replication and I identified the terminus of replication. There, it's not possible to do that in, with metagenomic sequencing. What we do with IREP is basically we take all of the DNA pieces, all of the contigs or scaffolds that belong to a specific genome, and we create a, an incline of the coverage skew uh, along the, the genome. So what we actually get is uh, an incline. So basically what's the, we, we try and match or correlate 
the different pieces according to their coverage, and that's the value we, we get out of it. Um, there's a lot of more, I mean, uh-huh. I, I can't say I remember all of the specific the details, details. Uh, uh-huh. of yeah. the program, but that's one thing. And also, uh, you might have seen that there were a lot of uh, points that we did not have data from. So uh-huh. for normalization or for optimization, um, there's a lot of cutoffs that are going on. So it has to have a minimum coverage um, it cannot be too fragmented. So if the, the genome has too many pieces, we just can't use it. So we have a lot of filters to select only results that we are comfortable with. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure that students understand that we are yeah. using yeah, a very neat yeah. uh, tool to do that. And I have a more biological question, actually, and uh, pertains to the actually events right before the crash for the you know for the initial crash right so you measure the growth rate and who is present right before the crash and during the crash but you know there is there must be an event that happens on the bioreactor right before the crash why that re- a particular set of bacteria or group of bacteria is start to grow in faster so what is the actual trigger for that event do you guys yeah. have some idea what actually happens in terms I, of nutrients and uh, other you know, factors, intrinsic factors to the, uh, the bioreactor right before the crash? Yeah. So this is a very good question. And one that we, we are trying to answer with the, sorry, with the second, with the experimental crash that we did, because basically, I mean, putting everything on the table, we were very lucky that we, by chance, had a time point one week before the crash. We did not think that something is going to happen. We had no indication that something was going to happen. We assumed that we were sampling a stable state uh, community. And so there is a lot of luck that went into it. So for the first time, we did not have enough data for the second crash. We did sample uh, several time points leading up to the crash. And we, uh, we have two hypotheses that we are still not uh, decided upon. So basically, we are trying to figure out if we have a gradual change or that we have like a frame shift, something fast, something happened to it. And the initial uh, results we have do show that it's basically like everything in biology. Nothing is so clear, it's a mix. So you do see um, that we have gradual changes in expression for both um, the heterotrophic bacteria and the brocadia. So one of them works or has lower and lower metabolism and Mm -hmm. others have higher and higher metabolism. But that is something that is not seen in in the reactor performance, which means that basically everything that happens at the microbial-microbial interaction uh, is not seen at the community level. Everything looks fine, and we're also uh, looking at relative abundance that is count data, so the number of bacteria and not looking at biomass. So what we say is there is enough biomass to keep sustaining the reactor while well, things are starting to deteriorate slowly and it's basically a, just a prolonged process of heterotrophic bacteria eating up more and more of the extracellular matrix um, i think that, that that is one thing that it did not go into because the animals create these really beautiful granules and i guess that when it's broken up that means that um, their um, functionality is... It can increase good. the carbon. Yeah. yeah, if you think about yeah. from marine systems, you have the marine snow and there's anamox there. So the outer, outer surface is aerobic bacteria that have one function and the core is the anamox bacteria that have a different function. Mm-hmm. So the physical structure has functional meaning. I mean, that is distru- disrupted. Mm-hmm. 
that leads to this chain okay. event. Interesting. Okay. I have uh, questions from the students, if I may, Andrea. I can read yes. it. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, the first one is two of them pertains to the same trade of what you are doing right now. So one is technical, and a student is uh, basically asking um, about your sample sampling uh, process, right? So how you decide uh, how many samples for how long in each period of time you're taking the samples. So basically, this is the question uh, during the basically the sampling process. Uh, that you guys yes, if, if you have decided it, it before you see the crash yeah. for the unexpected crash, you have a time point like uh, every two days or every week or every you know a, a period yeah. of predefined period of time. And there's so what happened leading up to the first unexpected crash? We did not have a, a very clear timeline and. The idea was to study Anamox startup. So, I mean, the, what I did not focus on, it started out as time zero, then 80 days, then 160 days, and so forth. But then things happen and you start reacting to that. Mm -hmm. And that was when we had more uh, chaotic sampling theme. Mm -hmm. But for the experiment, for instance, we did decide we're going to increase uh, nitrogen loading. We're going to sample at these time points. And we're going to sample every two weeks uh, until we see something happen. Obviously, when we see something happen, we might increase our sampling because we want to get more time points because things are moving on. There is more dynamics, so we need more time points. And also, I mean, there is also an ex like funding going into it. You can, <laughs> we knew that we had uh, 12 time points that we can sample that is going to be secret at the JGI, so we decided that's the amount yeah. we can do. You understand that. <laughs> but we supplemented that with a lot of, so I did not show that, but we also have 16S surveys. So uh -huh. sampled uh, much more regularly, uh, only the 16S. So okay. we match that. Uh, it's a bit hard, and I discussed that in the paper. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you are able to match the 16s to the genomes uh, nicely, mm -hmm. then you could keep following that. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. It does show similar trends. I have a next one yeah. uh, from the student. She's asking, and I'm going to read it. Did you access the influence of factors such as pH, concentration of nutrients, and the different forms of reactive nitrogen in the system that could have influenced the NMOX assemblage and turnover? Yeah, a very good question. So <clears throat> we, we tracked, as you can see, we tracked. We did not look at all the nitrogen species, unfortunately. Um, looking back at the analysis, if we could have looked at um, and other, uh, the, mostly the intermediate uh, species that we see in denitrification, that would have been very important because before we had the transcriptomic data, basically we were considering two scenarios. So either DNRA, which reduces nitrite directly to ammonia, or uh, just nitrate reduction. So the first step of denitrification, because these two metabolic paths can create very similar results biochemically. So if you're looking at ammonia, it can increase if a bacteria produces ammonia, and it can also increase because less bacteria are using the ammonia. So it's the same ammonia going in that's coming out, or it's more ammonia being produced. And since we did not measure uh, the uh -huh. nitrous oxide, which is volatile at the beginning, it was very hard to say. And for the first uh, paper, what we figured out that it was more energetically favorable uh, to reduce uh, nitrite directly to ammonia. And that's what we, we that's how we decided which path was uh, 
It's better we yeah we monitored pH we monitored uh, biomass. Um, did you saw any differences in pH? Sorry. During the pH during the crashes. Did you see any difference? No. no. There, there wasn't uh, anything major that like that. No. What what we did do is we did tweak some of the vitamins and the trace uh, minerals. Um, based on literature, so I think mm -hmm. we increased uh, copper or something like that during the first crash. Um, if you look at the performance, it looks like that is something that uh, was very important. But if you look at the metagenomic data, uh, we saw that things were starting to improve while, like, as the, we were changing the trace elements things were already starting to improve. So it, it mm -hmm. probably helped, but we didn't see anything uh, on that end that was Amazing. highly significant. Mm -hmm. I can read the next one, if I may. Uh, it's another student. Is it possible to indicate groups within the bioreactor microbial community that are codependent or co-occur in a cooperative relationship? Uh, yes. Um, so, um, one of the things that I looked at um, with the um, community is uh, what is called metabolic interdependencies. Um, it's based basically on oxytrophy. So, if a certain bacterium in the community cannot produce, for instance, uh, vitamin B12, and another bacterium can produce vitamin B12, our assumption is that bacterium A needs to get its vitamin B12 from bacterium B. So we, we looked at amino acid synthesis, we looked at uh, vitamin uh, synthesis, and we, we did see that, uh, for instance, protobacteria produce a lot of vitamins and amino acids that contribute uh, to the animox bacterium and to other members and for instance, I did not go into it, uh, the Ignavi bacterium has a lot of oxytrophies for amino acids. So that means that it takes a lot of amino acids from the community. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one way we looked at, and now we're trying to supplement that with uh, metatranscriptomic data. Um, and there is other people that are planning to do um, isotope labeling to actually track how certain materials uh, go through the mm -hmm. community. There is actually another uh, group that I unfortunately forgot their name because I'm really bad with names. Mm -hmm. But there is a very, uh, Macan group, I don't know, I'm sorry. There is a good group that I saw in ASM uh, when we could still have in-person uh, meetings uh, that did an amazing job tracking uh, carbon in the community using stabilized stops. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. I uh, will summarize, uh, summarize some of the questions here because I think yes. we're talking about more or less the same and uh, running the same out of thing, time. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, so we'll uh, just make these two questions, two more questions. One of them that will they'll gather several uh, other ones that is uh, based on your knowledge that you guys acquired during the process, okay? It's supposed to test the hypothesis by adding your hypothesis by, a hypothesis by adding organic carbon to a functioning reactor and see if it crashes. Um, we cannot do it to a full-scale reactor, but yes. Uh, so some of the work that is planned right now by a new grad student, uh, Christian, he's going to spike the reactor with uh, organic carbon, so he's going to test. He's going to test different types of uh, organic carbon, different durations of uh, this perturbation to see. Basically, we're trying to nudge the community to towards the performance crash in a different way. So mm -hmm. we had looking at replication. Now we're going to look at the organic carbon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the last one, I think. Uh... The last product of the DNRA, like bacteria, the community, DNRA, is ammonia. Yes. And ammonia is one of the substrate for the NMOX. 
should not it increase the NMOX process? So I think the, the point here is, is a loop in the bioreactor. Uh, does the crash, uh, do the crash resolve itself by by themselves? <laughs> that's that's the point, I think. No, no. So <laughs> well, the problem is that Anamox uses two nitrogen products. It uses nitrate, so NO2 as the electron donor, and yeah, donor. No, sorry, electron acceptor and ammonia as the electron donor. Okay. Right, so it needs both of them. What the DNRA does, it reduces the nitrite, so it removes NO2 from this equation. So you don't have the acceptor. Yeah, and they need, the ratio is around 1.2 ammonia to one nitrite, and if we reduce it, 2.5, then there is a limit to what it can do. Yeah. So you have an increase of amount of ammonia, and it, it will not be used in the metabolism yeah. at all. What what will happen is it would need to go through nitrification, so through an aerobic process, back to a nitrite, which is impossible in an anamox reactor because anamox reactor is anaerobic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Ray, my final question, then, to conclude, uh, uh, can you have, you know, you guys have a device for people working with full-scale reactor, so to avoid crashes, to have any idea how they can, you know, look for before the crashes, so returning to my first question about what yeah. actually triggers the process of the crash. Yeah. So, we were discussing it in, in, in the lab, and um, there is the idealistic answers, which is track these groups of bacteria, so track fluoroflexy, track DNRA expression, but this is probably not something that can be done in full-scale reactors or very hard to do. Um, but looking at the integrity of the granules for instance, is one thing that they do, because they do sample and they do have pretty fast ways to measure that. And we're, another thing is spikes in nitrate. I did not go into it, but we do see small spikes in nitrate happening uh, just before crashes. So monitoring all of the nitrogen species to, to detect early on changes in their composition and um, might be one way to go. One way to go. Okay. Great. Great. So, Great. We are, <laughs> yeah, right, we are out of time. So, yeah. you, you know, uh, thank you so much again for a very nice talk, Ray. It was great to have you here. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And you thank you very much. The students were very interested. Yeah. That uh, in the YouTube, yeah. and uh, uh, they, they, they make uh, very congratulations to you. <laughs> A lot of congratulations to you. Okay. Thank you. And if there are additional questions, I'll be happy to answer them. You can email me. And, um, yeah, I can pass them along. No problem. Yeah, I'll answer. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in another opportunity. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, when everything, when we yeah. can go out of the house again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Boa tarde a todos. Não sei se vocês entenderam, mas ele se prontificou a responder qualquer, quaisquer outras perguntas por e-mail, tá? Nós temos um e-mail, é só entrar em contato e caso vocês ainda tenham algumas perguntas, a gente direciona para eles. Tá bom? Boa tarde a todos. Até a próxima semana. Boa tarde.